Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to uh, Dumb SEO Questions, uh, episode 339. Uh, each week we meet here to answer the questions asked on the SEO Questions community. Um, ah, Tim Kappa. Thank goodness. Um, Tim, uh, Tim Kappa um, is just joined us. And uh, as I was saying, we, we, we asked the questions um, that are left for us on the Dumb SEO Questions Facebook group. With us tonight, we have um, Richard Hearn. Richard uh, um, is um, uh, an SEO for the upper echelon uh, site. Um, he uh, deals in newspapers and um, um, he's based in uh, Thailand and uh, um, you can find Richard at redcardinal.ie. Masataki Wasa is webmaster of wasaweb.net. Uh, he's based in London. Uh, he uh, uh, lives in Wimbledon and um, he's also a Google product expert on the uh, AdSense uh, community. And Tim Kapper uh, is. Uh, um, uh, do we not have questions on screen today? Not working, is it? Um, let me just see if I can fix that. Uh, no, didn't want that. How about that? That working better? Not working better. Yeah. Ah, well, handsome mug. I, I didn't realize I had a mug here. Uh, um, okay, let me see. It's, it's so so good good of good. Oh, they must have some sort of testing mechanism. When when everybody's happy, they change something. Change layout. How about that, uh, Tim? Is that working better? No. Ah, oh, dear me. No worries. Is that better? Uh, no, you're still. It's still you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny actually because my screen actually has three even-sized areas for yeah. visual, as opposed to what it, didn't it used to go to whoever was talking? No. Yeah, it's a mess, isn't it? So I wonder. Oh, ah, there we go, Jim. We got the questions now. Yep. How's that? Well, there you go. Uh, mm, yeah, there we are. You happy with that? <sighs> All right. Uh, what stage did we get up to? Uh, Tim Kappa. We, well, we talked about Rich. We talked about Masataki. Yes. Tim Kappa uh, is based in Corby, about a hundred miles north of London. Um, he's a Google product expert on the Google My Business uh, community. And um, you can find Tim at onlineownership.com. So redcardinal.ie for Richard, uh, uh, um, wasaweb.net for Mesataki, and uh, onlineownership.com for Tim. Okay, so we've got nine questions tonight. Um, the uh, first one is um, removing page footprints from the Google uh, index. Let's move on to that first. It's from Nanik Tri Widiawati. 
Um, Nanik said, uh, hello everyone, I'm building a site and, and the last time I picked magazine line theme in my WordPress, which has 10 built-in posts for helping me figure out how my templates look after a certain sit setting. Um, so, um, after that, I changed my theme and these posts' footprints are sticking, even though I deleted all of them. And these posts are indexed in Google. But as I clicked it, uh, it um, would not be found. Does anyone have any tips on how to delete uh, these or should I just uh, leave it at that because later it will be buried with other posts and won't affect the site performance at all? I hope you get what I'm trying to ask and many thanks. Don't fight over it. <laughs> and the answer always, it depends. New site, actually what I would do was a new site, I'd delete posts, I would create a little sitemap with those URLs in it, a brand new one, and I'd submit the sitemap to Google and they'll probably come and crawl them pretty much quickly, and then they'll probably remove them out. Has anyone else used the URL removal tool? I've used it, but I think that the URL removal tool, if memory serves me right, I think that there's a, a time limit on the removal of an URL, or is that another tool? No, I think you're right. Um, it um, expires after 90 days or something like that. Which is sort of what I always thought was a bit daft, but... I think it's for sometimes people use that tool to remove stuff that they still keep live. Um, I see someone said that there's a warning if you try to remove something that's live, but I'm not sure. I think you can still remove stuff because, like, I work with some regulated industries where legally they have to remove stuff sometimes, and they always just use the own removal tool. Yeah. Okay, let's um, move on to number two on our run sheet. Uh, I hope uh, Nanique uh, is happy with that response. Dave Elliott must have changed jobs, uh, according to some of the things he posted this week. I hope he's um, enjoying his new location. Um, he's asked a question today. It's, it's titled, Google is ignoring uh, rail next uh, slash prev. Um, he said, now that Google have helpfully told us that they ignore uh, RHEL Next and RHEL Prev, uh, um, what is the best way of dealing with pagination for blog category pages? Um, Self-canonical and uh, no index. Uh, follow anything past, say, page three. In the past, Google have said that a no index tag and follow will be treated as no index, no follow after an extended period of time. Um, should I care if the articles are in the site map anyway? Damn you, Google, for changing things. Um, what answer do we have for um, Dave, guys? Also, I'd like to point out people like Michael Martinez and um, He's um, others who answer questions um, through the week. Isn't he? But he's most often he's very much on the ball. In fairness to him, you know, despite what people might remember of him ten years ago, <laughs> like he is actually he's very helpful and he is he's quite on the ball with his answers. Also, like he's dead right. It's. This change is quite annoying, I think, because it sort of undoes also some of the the ideas you might have given people years ago. Like the idea that they decide to treat no index follow as no index no follow is, yeah, slightly bizarre. And then of course they get rid of this realm next previous. I think the best thing to do is with these category pages is that you, you customize your category pages so that you 
make like the head of the category like page one, page two usable, and deeper pages you just like ram a hundred links onto them, so that your your categories aren't so deep, and you just leave them indexed. Let Google do its own thing with them. Thank you. Know, you behavior of this right so if they change if they announce okay we don't we don't we don't look at rel next previous and they change all this behavior the only reason why they would say that they don't use it they wouldn't say we don't use it without having some alternative means of figuring all this out so you can be sure that they're going to handle it in some way yeah all right let's um move on um to number three on our run list uh, this one from Mick King, um, why do people charge per keyword? Do they do all the work around these keywords rather than a general overview of the website? So they, yeah, so, <laughs> Um, these are typically from very, very small um, SEOs that, and just, just, just to be aware, um, nine times out of 10, when I've ever seen or read these things being pitched, they tend to pick very sort of easy to rank for keywords so that they kind of make, so that they can rank it quite easily. And of course, make uh, some profit on the work that they essentially don't have to do. But I'm not saying that's for everyone. But um, but essentially, yeah, charging per keyword is really, really, really outdated um, um, because there's so much more of so much more to SEO than just ranking for a keyword um because and if you're paying for someone just to rank for a keyword they're not looking at any uh longer tail quick wins they're not looking at um you know does that keyword actually convert and will that keyword actually um you know bring bring you in the in 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 the sales um it's just you know, it's a it's such an outdated model when when keywords were the thing. Um, yeah, I would like probably stay away from that. You want if you're looking at SEO, you want to be looking at a company <laughs> that's not necessarily focused on keywords, but is focused on building the brand, uh, looking for opportunities uh, to increase you know relevant traffic and traffic that converts to whatever you know the 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 business model is um yeah i would i would stay away from things that offer keywords you know my own because it's not looking at a whole holistic approach if you do want to look at a company that offers keywords you need to ask them and understand how they're doing this and why are they offering it that and how are they going to be working uh, at achieving that? Uh, because they might they might not necessarily have updated sort of their wordings or their thinkings over the time, but they might still be working on the larger the larger whole holistic thing of of their keyword rather than just their keyword. So you know, first thing would be ask them, um, you know, on 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 what they're going to be doing. But typically, it's really outdated, and you don't want to be focusing on a keyword. Um, yeah. You'd imagine it's probably also pitched at small companies. It's probably that level of the market, people who are not tech savvy, who maybe don't know what they're doing in t inside themselves. And then it's they get a report saying your keyword is up three spaces this month, or yada, yada, yada. But I, I, I doubt you're going to get it. it Maybe it works for some people. I don't know. It's very hard to know. Not something I've ever done. Okay. Let's um, move on to the next on our run list. 
um, it's number uh, four from Palo Pinkas. A lot of new people tonight. Um, he said, traffic is zero after I changed the per permalink. Well, of course. Um, he said, I changed the permalink setting recently. Since then, my traffic is zero. What happened? <coughs> <coughs> and Brenda Michelin said, um, since your URLs are different, uh, you need to have 301 redirected all of the old URLs to the new. Anybody would like to add anything for Paula? Don't change your URLs unless you really have to. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Uh, okay, let's um, move on to the next. Mark X Quadros, who asked a question of us last week, um, wants to know, is it important to have specific schema markups? Um, for instance, uh, about markup, uh, contact markup, etc. He said, my client has uh, an organization, has organization markup on most pages. I know that they shouldn't have it on contact, so uh, I'll change that. But what about the um, the rest? Well, your organization markup can generally follow through all your pages. Um, it, it depends on what you define on the page because, you know, organization markup is pretty um, massive. It can contain a lot of things, but you can have your base standard organization markup running site-wide. Obviously, if it's, you know, organization or, you know, or, or, or possibly it's a, a large chain and then it's got local businesses. So that will change because that would contain the information of local businesses on those particular pages. Um, and then, of course, if it was a product or a product page, then then part of that organization would drop out because then you would include products. But, you know, and um, if you had a staff or a team page, that's when within the organization markup, it would start including people within the organization and what their responsibilities. So it, it literally can run sidewise, but then you addition, you, you, you add, you know, or you remove or add depending on what is on that page. Um, hopefully someone can maybe explain what I'm trying to say better. <laughs> I'm sure what you said was uh, fine, Tim. Um, if yeah, there are no objections, Google Google is not. If you if you're defining structured markup for a given page, you can't relate that markup to what's on another page easily. I mean, you can build links between pages, as in within structured data. But when Google is looking at one one, let's say a graph or an entity of graphs. Uh, you can't relate that to what's on a different page. That's not the way Google works. They see it on a per page basis. So if you only have organization on a single page of your website and it's not in all others, they're not, Google is not going to be able to necessarily define that what you've got in other pages is related to the organization. So you have to think about it like what would it look like semantically? An organization probably owns a website if you're using structured data. A website will contain web pages, and web pages may be have main entities, which could be people or articles or contact or whatever it might be. So if you start to think about it semantically, you build your structure markup based on what it would look like if you drew a picture of what it is you're describing. And generally, you have everything on every page. Thank you, Richard. You don't have to, but you can do. Cool. All right, let's um, move on to number six on our run list. That's from Dean Bellingham. It's titled Local SEO, Changing the Business Address. Dean said, quick question. Uh, my client has a service-based business uh, that when they set up their Google My Business, 
uh, they use their home address. Now they rank number two in the pack for their local area. Um, if I go in and change it to service-based business and add all the places uh, that they um, um, they service, um, will this have a negative effect on their ranking, if you understand what I mean? So, Dean, glad you asked this. You're going to have to wait for my article to come out in the next uh, week or so. <laughs> <laughs> but I will give you preliminaries on this. So I decided to test this because loads of people have asked what happens when I change my um, local uh, business to an SAB. Now, this is the way I've run it so far for my test. Okay. Um, essentially, think about your address. Uh, so my address is the town, it's Corby. Um, obviously, included in the address is the county. Uh, if you're in the States, that would be, the, you know, the state. So uh, is Northamptonshire. And then, of course, I'm in the UK. Um, so I set up tracking for my local, for Corby, obviously all my main sort of terms, for Northamptonshire as a whole, for the same terms, and for the entire UK for those terms. And these are the, uh, so all of them, all of them, the day I changed it to SAB, tanked for uh, one, two, three, for five days. Um, the, uh, the Corby one, it's where, it's, which is where I actually am, um they've all come back to all their positions which would be as expected because although you've changed or although you've removed your removed your actual um uh, address uh in your service area business google still has a record of that in, in in the back end they know where you are they know what 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 town whatever of course, I also have my address running across my site, um, and over the, over you know over the years, uh, I've you know content-wise, I've created a lot of content specifically about this business or that business, you know, locally and things like that. So, the Corby itself has all come back. Northamptonshire, which is a like the entire county or state. Um, that has come back also after five days, then we had a blip and come back, but essentially they are, I'm just comparing quickly, all the main terms are almost all there, right? uh as previous now the uk one which i was i was thinking like i mean this is like countrywide they same again had the five day disappear all come back uh now of course local pack you must remember so your local pack it, it you know google's not going to show if somebody is in london and he's searching specifically for like local seo he's, he's not going to show me regardless of what i said there's just you know it's not going to they know where you are you know um and there's probably about 500 local seos between his search uh, location and me so you know in being realistic however i did come back for all my local queries being searched from a uk ip um and so yeah that that that's all as, as expected so preliminary findings now is you're going to have a drop, right? Uh, you're going to have a drop. I'm assuming you've got citations built because your citations will also have your location in, right? Um, so, so the preliminary results are you've got. There's going to be a drop as everything figures itself out again. You know, after a week, you do come back. Um, now, there will be one interesting thing that I did do when I changed it to service area business was i specifically set those three areas i specifically set 
Corby as my area, yeah, Northamptonshire, as in the entire county where Corby is based, and I set the service area as the UK. So they are specifically set as my service areas because I obviously had to define things for this test. But um, by defining those, literally none of the positions have gone anywhere. They, you know, disappeared, but then they came back. Uh, and that I'm also going to say with a caveat is assuming that Google sort of understands where you are, even though as a local business change to SAV, I'm assuming you do have citations out there um, and, and things like that so that it can still kind of tie it into where you are uh, as such. So go for it. Thank you, Tim. Yep. Okay, let's um, move on to number seven on our run list. Um, it's titled Disallowing a Directory via Robots Text. Um, Dixon Jones, um, who you, most of you all know, um, is uh, used to be the brand ambassador for Majestic. Um, Dixon, anyway, said, uh, hmm, does this work? Disallowing a directory and then allowing a subdirectory. Um, in other words, um, disallow um, um, a, a directory at the top and then allowing a subdirectory within that um, directory, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing anyway. Anyway, um, should I want Google looking at that Ajax thing? I don't know what he means. Um, let me just see. Um, we've got user agent. Um, General disallow WP admin. Yeah, fair enough. And um, okay, I'm pretty sure that they in the documentation they say that they will they will take the more specific rule over the less specific rule. So the one with the longer URL will be taken to be the rule that that they should apply. So they'll allow that for that particular URL, but for the other URLs they'll apply the disallow. So it should be fine to do. Well, what's yeah. attack actually is not 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 trivial, you know. It's there's all sorts of weird and wonderful rules, and there's some things that, that Google do not follow the RFC for robots that text. They have their own different rules they apply, which is sometimes a little bit uh, unnerving. Most people don't go near robots that text, and I don't blame them. Yeah, it's it's um. It, comes from um, um, feeling that they're invincible and, and, and you know I think I think it'll come around to bite Google one day um, anyway agents are also another area of robots that text that can be non-trivial and certainly non-obvious sometimes how they apply what blocks will apply to what user agent yeah and I think part of the problem is that Google is trying to second guess what the webmaster wants to do in that many people make mistakes in their robots.txt file and end up doing something they had not intended. And I think Google is trying to, in a sense, avoid that situation where um, things get indexed where, or accessing folders and files that the webmaster had intended them not to, if mm. that makes sense. So that, you know, as a webmaster, you make a mistake in your robots txt. Google comes around, snoops around, and you're not happy, even though it is you who made a mistake. Um, you might not be too happy about that fact. Um, you know, and it, it could be quite serious because of privacy concerns, etc., etc., etc. People could easily lose their jobs if they don't write proper robots txt file and i think that's where this thing comes from where google doesn't do as the specifications tell because i think many people have inadvertently allowed access or uh, that i think that's the problem isn't it you know. the ease that you can make a mistake is probably one part of it i mean but there's other things like i mean google have that has their own robots text the testing tool 
So you'd assume that, let's say you disallow a folder in your robots.txt, okay, and then you go into the testing tool and you try to reach an image that's inside that folder. Their testing tool will say it's allowed because it doesn't work for non-HTML non -HTML files, um, which is plenty daft, to be honest. So, yeah. Yeah. Text, like I say, is actually one of the more complicated areas of SEO, and even for regular developers, I'm sure it's very difficult to figure out what's going on. Yep, fair enough. All right, let's um, move on to number eight, unless uh, somebody has an objection to that. Okay, number eight on our run list is from Saurabh Rawat. Saurabh asked the question, it's titled, How to Show My Website uh, in People Also Ask. You know, where, where it, you see on the page a block of questions that people also ask. He's, anyway, Saurabh said, what should I do to show my website in PAA? People Also Ask. It's heavily related to featured snippets. Sorry, Tim, you go on. Um, so, um, yeah, look, you, you've got to be, um, you know, you, 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 like Dave said, you've got, um, Dave says between one and five. Um, not necessarily sh entirely sure that's accurate uh, because I've come across some hotel queries where the um, where position one to ten is all um, uh, is is all OTAs or online travel agents tra online travel booking systems, um, but the property or the client or the hotel actually features um in 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 that um you know in the people also ask just before you click next at the bottom so i th i'm just going to go with the branding of it um yeah i've I, yeah i mean i can't give you like an exact answer to this um but what i've found is that for you know for other queries or queries that aren't the short tail just for the the one where the you know the, the all the other uh booking sites appear position one to ten um the property is in the local pack or well actually called the hotel finder i suppose for hotel queries they do appear in there for the query, then you've got all the uh, OTAs, position one to five, and then at the bottom you do have, um, you know. Uh, so I'm going to say maybe not necessarily one to five, but I do think you have to have some kind of overall majority of positioning for X amount of queries before Google starts thinking, yeah, why don't you check this one out? Or people also ask for this one. Um, it could, on the very basic level of it, people then refine their query uh, because they may see you in a search in a snippet or, or something like that, and they literally refine their search query to retype in with your brand name. Um, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I mean, those are just sort of guesses. Oh, could we just clarify here? Because people also ask is that um, few questions that would appear in a box form, isn't it? And uh, oh, yeah, that uh, the new featured snippet thing. Hey, yeah. um, uh, so it's where there's one question and then it gives that list of other questions that people yeah. answer. And they're normally very, very tightly related. Mm. Yeah, you and it's sort of an expansion, isn't it, over the question asked? Sorry, Richard. Yeah. yeah no, you yeah. go on. 
No, so you know, you might start with a particular product name or a very vague query, and then you know, if it's if it's sort of a medicine or pharmaceutical product, then you know, the question might be, is this safe? Or you know, can I give it to my children? That kind of thing, uh, and then sort of so there would be four or five questions which you can expand, and it'd be sort of the snippet type answer coming up, and then you know, if you choose to click through, then you click through. So um, I think, it, of course, to appear in that, you, I think you'd have to give sort of shortish answer. That would don't aren't those also pulled from their own featured snippets? Yeah, so that's they're, specific they're, question. All, they're basically related featured snippets. So the more featured snippets you can rank for, the more chance you're going to appear in those. So you got to start looking into how do you rank for featured snippets and what mm -hmm. sort of content do you need to generate to get there. Um, there's something you can do if you have a small list of, of questions that you know are related to what you want to rank for. Um, you can scrape Google. I'm not going to get into how you do it, but you can scrape Google to get the people also ask, and it will sort of constantly expand the list. And you can go away and you could have like 30 or 40 different people also ask questions. And then you just basically you're going to write content to answer those questions and see if you can do it in a way that you get featured snippets. And that's how you get to rank them. Like it's, it's, it is basically you target featured snippets, you're going to appear and people also ask. Like that's, it'd be very difficult to be otherwise. Yeah. And I think the interesting thing is, I think it'd be, it might be tough to get to the first of the five. But if you, as Richard said, if you expand, 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 you know, some questions are more specific, some questions are broader, some questions, you know, might be sort of personalized so that you know, Google might have sort of the age, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, information. Um, and then, you know, about 10 or 20, then it starts to lose you know, the specificity. And that, in a sense, I suppose, is the, um, opportunity area yeah yeah so um yeah totally it is 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 feature snippets because um i've just searched wedding furniture higher costs um so we've got the featured snippet one of my clients and then in the people also ask it asks how much is it to hire a chair mm -hmm. and we've also got that one yeah in another particular featured snippet for Another thing, answering how much does it cost to hire chairs and tables. Um, yeah, so totally. Yeah, it's yeah featured snippets. But you, you want to get a, a seed list and try to get like five related yeah. questions for each question. Yeah. And you just you build it out like that and just but, you know, target that content. Yeah, but I've also noticed it slightly does change a little bit because I've got one here for wedding hire costs. For, yeah. So for the search query, wedding higher costs, yeah. we've got the featured snippet for that, specifically uh -huh. for wedding hire for 100. Now, there's mm -hmm. a, a people also ask, there is one for wedding costs for 100. And who's got it? Come and on. that's another guy who deals, who's costing out food-wise. So that's quite interesting. Um, I, so they may also be jiggling a bit because the one that specifically answers it is the featured snippet. Then people also ask, and they've picked another one. However, we've got which relates to food. So in something that is not specific, because I'm just the, the query here is wedding higher costs. Yeah. It's not specific. Specific that could be from anything from the room to the furniture to the food to you know all sorts i think google then mixes that up a bit depending on what they've answered initially they may do but i actually think what you're probably seeing there is that your one that ranks even though your one is about 100 people google is seeing it as being more specific to do with that wedding costs that that mm. shorter shorter query and if you mm. look at the guy who's ranking for wedding costs for 100, even though he's talking about catering, if you start to look at his snippet and the content that they're taking, 
you may start to identify certain words in there that yeah. actually have a have a have a more direct meaning to the answer that the people are looking for. Yeah. So I've seen cases where featured snippets and um, okay, I'm sort of like some of the ones I'm working on are they're sort of bigger, like there there's a lot more competition for them. You go in, you change one word in the featured snippet in the content that they're that they were taking. And you get the feature snippet back from people who had it. Like that, that literally can be all it takes is one word or two or three words that are added into the content that they would that they they would see as the featured snippet, and suddenly you can take the featured snippet. So there's an awful lot of language processing goes on within featured snippet selection, um, and it's one of the things that I never see them talk about. Like as in the big companies that do all the research, they never seem to research the language. If you look at the patents, the patents talk about the language, like what type of language they're after. It's a major, major part of it, and it's definitely possible to to take feature snippets from other people by changing your language. Sorry, Masataki. Oh, no problem. No, it, it is quite interesting because I put in wedding hire costs, and then the so the answer box thing um, is for the UK. So the average wedding cost in the UK, 2018. And the first item when people also ask was how much does a wedding for 150 guests cost? Mm -hmm. And the and that source is from the US. So the prices are in dollars. In a sense, that doesn't you know it is a bit odd in that sense because it is a Google based oh so UK based mm -hmm. search query and the snippet, the first snippet for 150 guests. They're, they're, not comes good, from they're not good at that. They're not good. At, like what I think they're better at language than they are at country. Yeah. So like if you change, let's say you went away and you changed your query to French, you just went off and started searching on Google.fr or whatever. I think you'd probably find then that when it's not English, you'll probably get, I think the results might be a bit better. <coughs> I think they have quite a problem with English based content with their knowledge graph. That it's not it's non-trivial for them to realize that a, a query like that, which if you think about the query itself, it's got quite a lot of components within that query, and then they've got to figure out what's right for a, a, a specific location, and it, it's I, I can imagine it it gets much more complex, but they're not good at that stuff. I've seen that quite a bit. But it's still, I mean, it's still also, it maybe opens up an opportunity for someone in the UK to start looking at some of those people also ask questions and say, you know, could we do things like, I mean, is there any changes we can make to the language, whether it's UK English spelling as opposed to US spelling? Now, that said, that may not work, given that they're, they're happy to put up US dollars in the UK, sir. Yeah, and the second one is in pounds, sterling, so that's yeah. interesting. Um, but again, you see, this is, I think, where the language, they're less interested probably in the pounds, sterling, and the US dollars, and they're more interested in the language that they associate with the query. So if you look at the actual content that's probably taking that, that, that featured snippet, the, the people also ask, number one, and you, if you stick that into, let's say, uh, like Google's natural language API and see what Google spits back as the entities on the page, not on the page necessarily, but in that featured snippet block, then you start to get you'll start to get ideas about how you can actually build your own content to target this stuff, and like the natural language API is like it's free for a thousand queries. There's a, a web interface you can use as well. Like it, this this area is pretty interesting. Like there's definitely uh, opportunity there if you can get this stuff right. Mm, absolutely, it's all US based ones actually. Interesting, except for the second one, which is about marquee costs. That's quite specific. Not not trying to denigrate the, the our, our US brethren, but I, I imagine that they don't use the mark the term marquee quite so often. Mm. This stuff is really I mean, this stuff to me is sort of the really interesting stuff around SEO these days is where it's gone sort of this it's moved towards this entity based approach to search and, and indexing and all the rest of it. And like this all is related to the knowledge graph. This is the, like if I was taking up SEO or I knew someone who said, what should I do in SEO? I'd say, you know, learn semantic stuff and entity based, entity based search. Like this is where I think you're going to see more and more opportunity over time. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And I mean, it, it is high visibility. I mean, to be honest, it's the only thing I see. I see ad, ads at the top, 
then yeah. the feature slip it, and then people always ask, and that's the whole screen. And watch them treating you like a junkie if you click on any of the people also ask answers and just adding in more and yeah. more answers each time. Like it's such a, you know, really is such a junkie type of uh, of user experience. You know, they just keep giving you more and more to keep you there in the surf. It's yeah, it's pretty deplorable. But anyway, I'm sure it works for them. The only odd thing is, do you know what's funny? That they don't actually update the, the ads they show you when you start clicking on more of those. I'm sure they will someday. <laughs> so it makes sense. You know, you're sort of changing your query. It's sort of like, you know, when they, they give you these other, did you mean something else? Or they show you a carousel with related entities and you click it and it's a new search result. Like, I'm sure it's in their interest to try and rebuild the search query because if they rebuild your search query, they can show you new ads. And they show you new ads, they've got more chance of you clicking on an ad. So I, I'm sure they've tried it, wouldn't you know? I'm sure they try everything. Yeah. Well, they could just you know, tag an ad at the end of it. I'm sure they could try also. I'm sure they'd love to be able to tag an ad in there and just not have any sort of a notification that it is an ad. That would be their ultimate dream. <laughs> Oh, most interesting discussion. Um, yeah, what a gem. All right, let's. Um, if uh, nobody has anything further to add, and I can't see how, um, let's move on to our last question for the night. Okay. All right, from Amit Sharma. He wants to know where he should put his blog pages. That's the title. He said, I have a website in WordPress, and it's for my IT agency, and now I want to start a blog page. Should I create a new menu for the blog um, on the existing website or buy a new subdomain? Well, what, what you mean is buy a new domain, um, and, and then create a blog website. This has to be one of the longest standing SEO challenges of all that I know of. <laughs> it's been going on for years and years, subdomain versus subfolder. I'm a subfolder guy, by the way. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> right. Yeah, the question was a bit unclear as to whether he um, wants a totally separate domain, not a subdomain, but a separate domain, or not. Because he was talking about um, purchasing a domain, wasn't he? Yeah, but I think he said he, to buy a new subdomain. I think he just maybe isn't quite aware that, like, once you have the domain, you can make as many subdomains as you. As you as your heart could possibly desire. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think <laughs> I'm, I'm a subfolder person as well. It makes it, I mean, having subdomains can make your life more complicated on the technical side of things that in the end, I mean, just take one example. Um, SSL TLS certificate. It's all grand and good if you have a wildcard one, but if you have to renew each and every subdomain, that that's one area when things can go wrong. Um, I mean, on the flip side of that, though, as well, I mean, there's plenty of sort of like bigger companies where they probably it, it's far easier for their DevOps people to to actually stick a blog in a subdomain because they may have their main site running on some some yeah. crazy esoteric CMS that doesn't provide anything like a blog, and then they want to have a blog, so they go, well, let's find a third-party blog provider, and we want it with CRM built in. Let's go with HubSpot or whatever it might be. You know, I mean, there's plenty of I'm sure there's plenty of cases where it makes sense to go in a subdomain. It may not be optimal, but it probably works and it's probably the easiest way for DevOps people to get it up, up and running. But um, certainly I think if you have the if you have a choice, you should try to integrate your blog with your main site. Well 
What are you, Tim? Subdomain or subfolder? Subfolder, if you can do it all day long. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I still remember the original. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, what's an ecom? Um, Magento. You, you, yeah, subfold. Trying to put a blog on that with sub with a subfolder was just like almost near impossible, like ten years ago. Um, so it was always subdomain. But um, and obviously, like you know, other things. But I, if I could, and depending obviously on the brand and what it is, I would certainly do um, a subfolder. You know, Magento, I, I believe, I don't know who, who bought them. One of the big companies bought them, but uh, they're no longer going to have a community version. So there'll be no free Magento. Thank God. The bane of so <laughs> many people's existence, Magento. Horrible. Not, not horrible, but God, it was such a resource hog. Like, Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Oh. The minute you'd see it, like if you'd see, you get a client with Magento, you'd be there like, oh no. Yeah, I'd be, yeah. You, the minute you say, what's your domain? You look at it and then you're like, oh, that looks quite nice. Mm, yeah, this looks quite fun, interesting. It, it's Magento. And like your whole world caves in. <laughs> mm -hmm. And not cheap either. Like some, some of those Magento sites, um, they're 120k to start, um, and it doesn't really matter, you know, which currency they're expressing it in. Mm. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, like they do have this that community version of the, that was obviously their sort of on ramp to get people in there. But uh, yeah, as I say, that's been discontinued. Thank God. So I think it's not not been discontinued for another year and a half or something. But still, it's good to know it won't be out there anymore. It'll probably get forked by somebody and. But, uh, you know, I just think it was, yeah, such a yeah. sort of horrible resource hog for, for most people. It just wasn't suitable unless you were able to support pretty hardcore systems to to to, to put it up there. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, let's... Um click this button and it is yes it is that time again thank you for watching um i'd like to thank um people like michael martinez uh, and uh, so many other people who answered questions uh, on our facebook group through the week um and i'd like to thank uh, especially uh, masataki wasa richard hearn and uh, Tim Kappa for their contribution tonight. Um, we'll be back uh, at the same time uh, next week uh, to do this uh, all again. Um, but for now, it's um, good night and uh, thank you very much.